Today I'm going to show you how to harvest your own birch sap using an electric screwdriver. We'll discuss what type of tree to choose, where to drill it and how to drill it. I'll even show you how to make a wooden tap in order to extract the sap from the tree. We'll also discuss a little bit about the history and uses and possible medicinal benefits of the birch sap. It's mid-March here in Scotland and the winter snows have finally melted. Spring feels just around the corner with temperatures pushing almost into the double digits. But we've still got crisp cold nights and that can mean only one thing. It's time for the annual birch sap harvest. There's a few tips to bear in mind when selecting your tree for harvesting birch sap. You're going to have to make sure that it's over at least 8 inches in diameter because anything smaller than that it's going to be a bit young and you're probably not going to yield any sap from it and tapping it's actually going to damage its growth cycle. You're going to want to look for a middle-aged to mature specimen with as big a trunk as possible and if you can find a tree where its branches and buds are going to be as high up the trunk as possible. For example I've got this amazing mature silver birch here next to me and its branches start at about five meters up the trunk so I know that it's going to have to pump its sap at a very high pressure and quite high speed up the trunk of the tree in order to get to those buds which means that when we tap it it's going to come out at a higher pressure. This silver birch has an incredibly wide trunk you can see it's just shy of my two meter ape index. Um, you're not always going to find beautiful mature silver birches like this in the UK because we're very good at chopping down trees here and not very good at replanting them so if you decide to regularly tap your birch trees for birch sap Please consider planting a few more birch trees nearby in order to keep the ecosystem going and uh, to negate any damage you might do to the birch trees in the long term by tapping them. After selecting a nice healthy large birch tree to tap, you're going to want to look for a spot on the trunk about four feet off the ground. I've found a little spot here where the bark is quite thin and smooth and clean and there's not too much lichen so I think I'm going to drill into this section here. Now on older birch trees you're going to find a lot of this loose papery and spongy bark. If you can you might want to remove a little bit of that in order to get closer to the actual trunk of the tree otherwise that's going to get in your way when you go to drill. So we've selected our spot on the birch tree here and it's time to go ahead and drill. On my drill today I've got a 10 millimeter drill bit and you wouldn't want to go any smaller than 10 millimeters. You probably wouldn't want to go any bigger than 18. I've also put a bit of tape here, which is about one and a half inches down. So I don't want to go into the tree any further than that because it's been shown that that's probably the most effective distance to drill in without causing long-term damage to the birch tree. I've also got here a tap that I made, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, with a little tapered shaft which is kind of made accordingly to the 10 mil. So I'm going to try and hammer this in. Now, think about harvesting birch sap a little bit like taking blood from a tree. Uh, you wouldn't put a dirty needle into a human to take blood and we're not going to put a dirty drill bit or a dirty tap into the tree to take the sap. So you could either boil the implements you're going to use in hot water or in this case I've got some isopropyl alcohol which is 99.9% .9 purity and I'm just going to give my drill bit bit of a spray there and let that flash off in the heat. I'm also going to do the same with my tap that's actually going to enter into the tree and this will kill any pathogens or uh, potential bacteria. This is the little spot here I'm going to enter with the drill. You can see it's slightly recessed so it's closer to the sap veins in the tree and it's also got quite clean new growth bark so I think it's going to be quite a nice healthy part of the tree to drill into. When we're drilling into the birch tree, we're going to go up into it at 45 degrees and as I said before, we're going to stop when we hit that one and a half inch marker on my drill bit. Get the hole started, then we're going to angle up. There you can see the sap is coming out already nice and quickly. Now 
a little indicator of the health of our drill hole, we're going to look for white pulpy bark. If it's brown, it probably means the part of the tree is dying or diseased and we don't want to drill there. So this looks nice and healthy, so let's see if we can get our tap in. So we'll stick the tap in the hole and give it a little knock. In terms of containers to catch the birch sap, I really like to use these four litre water bottles because they've got these uh, ribs on the design and we can use that with a bit of rope to secure the bottle to the tree in the event that a windy gust would blow it away and we'd lose all our harvest. So I'm using a pretty fancy wooden tap that I made here, but you don't have to use anything so fancy. You can actually buy um, pre-made metal fabricated spiles which are used by the maple syrup extraction industry and uh, they're really good. You can sanitize them and fire them into the tree and they've got a little hook on them where you can hang a container. You could also use a piece of wooden dowel the same size as your drill hole and you could actually drill out the center of the piece of wood and it would be very effective. You could cut a little notch in in order to hang your container as well. Um, this is one I've actually used in previous years which I just found on the ground. It was a, just a birch twig which I hammered into the hole and it just had a little notch here which I used to hang the plastic container. I've seen even some people, if they're making a hole in the tree with a knife blade, they can uh, insert a piece of birch twig and wrap the container around the tree and you can just get the drip off the birch twig. So there's loads of choices. Uh, just make sure that it's clean when you insert it into the tree because we don't want to introduce any of those pathogens. For our birch tap, I think I'm going to put a block of wood and I'm going to taper one side according to the size of the drill bit we use for the tree and then it's going to go out and uh, I'll cut a little groove in here and I'm going to drill out the centre with a long drill bit in order for the sap to go through. So imagine this bit's actually in the tree at this point. And then about here I'm going to drill a hole all the way through and I'm going to enter a piece of wooden dowel. That piece of wooden dowel is going to have a hole drilled through the centre and uh, on top of the dowel I'm going to add a little handle there. The idea is we can then rotate this dowel and we can rotate the hole to stop the flow of sap coming out when we don't need it. And this little groove here, yeah, will hang a pot or a container off here and that'll catch the sap. Another great way to extract the sap is to insert a rubber or plastic hose into the hole. 
rubber and plastic is obviously easy to sanitize and it's quite effective because you can run the tubing down to a container which could be 10 meters away or it could be one meter away. In the sort of heavy maple syrup industry they'll actually take tubes from all the trees in the surrounding area and run them into a master line which can then go downhill into a, a sort of collection tub where they can process it. When should you harvest your birch sap? Well it's going to depend and vary slightly in your area but here in Scotland at this altitude we're about 350 meters here it usually falls in to the month between March and April so you've got about a four week window. Anything later than that window and the sap is going to slow down once the bud on the tree is out and it's also going to taste a little bit sour so we want to try and catch this sap a bit earlier when the bud hasn't opened yet. Now I've been tapping these trees for about six years now so I've got used to the signs and sounds in nature which remind me and prompt me to tap the trees. The things I look out for are the arrival of the snowdrops and also the first daffodils, maybe daffodils coming up by about two or three inches out the ground. Also that's accompanied by that amazing evocative spring smell in the air where the cold ground is suddenly heated by the hot spring sun. You also notice that the uh, bird life in the surrounding area becomes a little bit more frisky. So these are all the telltales that I use to uh, prompt me to tap the birch trees. Now the best indicator that your tree is ready to tap for a sap is if the buds on the birch tree are about this big and they're small and brown. You don't want to see any green. If you see any green it means they're a little bit too late for the tapping season and you'll probably want to wait till next year. At this stage they're still drawing up all those amazing nutrients and sugars from the root system of the tree in order to power up these buds and let them burst into those lovely green vibrant leaves that you'll see in spring. For the past two seasons I've been just keeping the drill holes open and not plugging them and I was just taking a look into one a minute ago and realized that there is in fact bark growth starting to form at the end of the drill hole which proves that yes the birch tree can heal itself very happily without the use of a foreign body being hammered into the drill hole. Wow. Well it's been about two hours and we're already about a third of the way up this container. So I think this tree is going to be pumping pretty hard for the next few weeks. I think it's time we had a little taste of it. As you can see the colour is completely clear, almost indistinguishable from water apart from the fact that it's maybe a very very slight yellow tinge to it maybe. In terms of the smell It's quite sweet and smells a lot like the birch tree actually. If you wanted to know what a birch tree tastes like, well, if you try birch sap you'll know. Ah, so evocative, it brings back memories of the last time I did this last year. Really amazing. 100% recommend you try it direct from the tree. You can often find it in uh, shops and stuff, but that's often pasteurized so it doesn't have quite the same fresh flavour. It's so good I think I'm going to have another cup. And I, the rate that thing's filling up, I think I'll be drinking a lot of this over the coming weeks. Why do I drink birch sap? Well, for me personally, it's become a bit of a spring elixir. It kind of lifts you out of those long cold winter nights that seem never ending. And when it comes to this part of the year, it's almost one of my favorite rituals to get into. It's the tapping of the birch trees. I feel like it gives my mind and body a real boost. And because it's loaded with all these nutrients and minerals that live in the roots of the tree, and they're firing up to go to the buds to form those amazing green leaves, it kind of feels like it's also uh, letting the sap rise in your own body and uh, forming some new energy, some new ideas and uh, new motivation for the year. Next I'm going to show you one of my favourite hot drinks to make with the birch sap. We take our little camp kettle and fill it with a mixture of the birch water and some pine needles. We can brew up a really delicious spring pine needle tea. 
And while that brews up, we'll discuss a little bit about the folk remedies, the history and the uses of the birch sap around the world. Going well. Whilst the pine needle tea simmers away, I'll tell you a little bit about the nutritional content in birch sap. To start with, the sweet flavour that you taste when you drink it is because there's three types of sugar in there. There's fructose, sucrose and also glucose. And uh, some of the main trace minerals in there, we're going to look at phosphorus, zinc, iron, manganese and magnesium. And the most prevalent in terms of RDA are actually uh, calcium and manganese. So it would be good if you have, for example, osteoarthritis or in need of some extra calcium. Alongside those, there's also some trace amounts of folic acid, potassium, phosphorus, copper and vitamin C. There's also 17 amino acids in the birch sap. Uh, one of them is glutamic acid. And you also find the amazing compound betulin, which is found in birch trees. Betulin is really interesting, of course, because it can initiate a self-destruct sequence in some tumours and also slow the growth of other types of tumours. A lot of folk think that the sweetness in birch sap is due to uh, the natural sweetener xylitol, but that's actually not true. There's none present in the birch sap, it's actually produced through fermentation and some other chemical processes. Because of the relatively high sugar content in the birch sap, it doesn't actually last long without fermenting. Now this has led it to be used in many fermented drinks throughout history. Uh, it's very popular when mixed with honey to make mead. Also if you mix it with malted barley you can get quite an interesting effect uh, in forming an ale. If you mix it with regular barley, uh, you can get a kind of gruel sort of porridge mixture. And um, it's also very popular in making the Eastern European drink kvass, which is a low alcohol fermented drink. Now I believe around Eastern Europe, they would often add other additives into the birch sap when it's fermenting, such as lemon peel, juniper berries, and also blackcurrant twigs, which would enhance the flavor and also the fermentation process. Perhaps the best known reason why people harvest birch sap is for its purported folk remedies and medicinal uses. So it's been used for a long time to fight things like lung disease, gout, kidney stones, gallbladder stones, and uh, also to give people kind of a, a burst of energy, and especially newborn children were often given it in the past in Europe. In Scandinavia, it was often used as a tonic for scurvy, that kind of lack of vitamin C you might get in the winter when there's a, a lack of fruit and also green vegetables available. It's also been used as a cosmetic remedy. So the women of Eastern Europe would often use it in their hair to try and thicken their hair and make it more lustrous and beautiful. And also they would put it on their skin to make their skin lighter and apparently get rid of freckles. So it's been very popular in Eastern Europe for a long time for those cosmetic reasons. That'll do. Here in Scotland it's been used for at least 5,000 years. A, uh, the remains of a woman from Caithness, who was 5,000 years old, 
um, they found traces of birch sap inside her digestive tract, which proves that in Scotland, especially the north of Scotland, people have been using this for a long, long time. Now we can only imagine what she was using it for, maybe to fight off scurvy or to kind of give herself some energy in springtime. But uh, yeah, it's, it's got a long history here. And uh, traditionally in Scotland, it's been used for fighting baldness. So I think people would wash their hair in it and put it on their scalps, especially men, to uh, fight off baldness. So maybe in a few years when my hair's falling out, I'll give that a go. It's also said that Queen Victoria, when she came up to Balmoral for her Scottish visits, she would chug down lots and lots of birch sap in order to try and thicken her hair and uh, prevent it from thinning. In Scotland, it's actually was harvested traditionally up until about the 1940s when harvesting of birch sap ceased in uh, the highlands of Scotland. But actually it's making a bit of a comeback here in Perthshire and there's a couple of companies, at least one, uh, who are kind of harvesting birch sap on a more commercial scale which is quite interesting and I think they're doing it quite nearby. So there's supposed to be a good amount of vitamin C within the pine needles of Scots pine trees. The combination of the pine needles and the birch sap should see off any scurvy I caught this winter. Mmm, it's delicious. Incredibly sweet. Actually boiling it down there for about 20 minutes has reduced the uh, water content of the birch sap and made it even sweeter. So it's kind of on its way to turning into birch syrup. So a little bit like maple syrup, if you boil it down long enough, you can get really thick syrup out of it, which is a bit like maple syrup. Uh, it's a bit harder to make than maple syrup though, because um, you need even more birch sap than you would with maple syrup, because there's less sugar in the birch sap than there is in maple sap. So in the end it becomes a little bit less cost effective, because you have to boil down gallons and gallons of birch sap to get not very much um, syrup. I think it's something like 10 to 1 or maybe it's even worse than that. For the harvesting of birch sap is incredibly important in Eastern Europe, especially in places like Latvia, the Ukraine, Poland, uh, Estonia and all the way into Scandinavia, Finland, Norway and Sweden. And um, in Eastern Europe, actually countries like the Ukraine, the word for the month April is actually Berzin, which means the month of birches. And uh, it's also the same in Latvia, they have a term for the, the month of April which basically means a kind of sap gathering time. Birch sap also has a rich history in Scandinavia. In Norway it was mentioned in a medieval text as early as 1394 where it said that the Norwegian King Sverre was out in the wilderness uh, with his hunting party and all they had to drink was birch sap and they survived on birch sap alone for two days and two nights. And uh, in the Finnmark region of Norway, it was also used traditionally by woodcutters and herdsmen. If we go over to Sweden, as I said before, they would use it as a winter tonic against scurvy. And also they would mix it with barley to make a kind of porridgey gruel. In Finland, we also find it mixed with malted barley to make ales. And if we go to Estonia, the month of April is actually Malaku or the month of sap. So it's incredibly important around Scandinavia as well. come about two miles away to this lovely grove of juniper bushes because the next thing we're going to make is birch sap gin and the main ingredient of gin of course is juniper berries. That should be enough juniper berries. I've got a good mix and spectrum of some of the younger greener ones and the older dry ones that are black and brown. So I should get a good mixture of flavours there. Now we've got enough of our locally foraged juniper berries, I'm going to go get some Scots pine needles for the birch sap gin now.
Now to make birch syrup a little bit like maple syrup from the birch water we're going to add our birch water to this crock pot slow cooker and I've got about I think three litres capacity in this one. Oh no maybe it's four. So anyway we fill it to the brim and we're going to put it on setting high which is the hottest setting and we're going to come back to it in about maybe 15-20 hours and we'll leave the lid off and hopefully a lot of the water out of the birch sap is going to evaporate and leave us with a lovely syrup. And it's nice to do it this way because you don't end up or risk burning the syrup and making it turn black and tasting bitter. So we'll come back to it in about 20 hours and see where it is. Right, it's gin making time. So we're going to make a bathtub style gin which is basically just the botanicals infused in a base spirit and then I'm going to cut it with birch sap to make it the birch sap gin. And our botanicals here are red peppercorns, cardamom pods, we've got our locally foraged juniper berries, uh, Scots pine needles, probably about a handful of those, and I'm going to zest a little bit of orange and lemon in there as well. We'll get some of the rind off of the orange and the lemon and it's important apparently not to um, get too much of the white pith because it can be very bitter. So we're just going to go for the flesh. And I'm not sure if I'm going to get the rind off the whole thing, maybe about half of the orange. There we go. To be careful not to get too much pith there. Right, now's for the easy and fun bit. We've got our food grade ethanol, 96%. And we're basically going to pour that into our kilner jar. Make sure if you're doing this to get uh, proper ethanol, not denatured ethanol, not methanol, because all those are probably going to be very poisonous. If you're interested, this um, extract grade ethanol base spirit is from a company called Extract Lab and as I said before it's from organic wheat so I think it's often used by gin distillers so it should actually be quite a good quality base spirit so we're basically just gonna chuck all of our infusions in our botanicals now this is the first time I've done this so I'm kind of completely winging it um, in 12 hours I might check how it tastes and I maybe take some things out and put some more stuff in depending on how it tastes. So I might put the pine needles in next. I tried to do a little bit of research to find out kind of rough quantities. Um, in, it's possible I'm putting too many juniper berries in here actually but we'll see. Now I read that you can either put the berries in whole or crush them a little bit and apparently if you crush them there's a little bit more of the bitterness from the juniper flavour and if you leave them whole um, there's a bit more of juniper sweetness so what I might do is put half in whole like that and I might give the other ones just crush them up a tiny bit. I've heard cardamom pods can also be a little bit overpowering so some of those might get whisked out in a few hours we'll see. So I'm going to put the juniper in here with the cardamom and the peppercorns. And I'm just going to use the end of a knife and kind of just squish them a little bit. Wow, it smells good. Right. I'm going to close that up, give it a small sugar. Wow, there's already colour coming out amazingly. Must be from the orange and the lemon. Right, I think we'll check back in about 12 hours and see how this thing tastes. MP, what do you reckon? Do you know? No, not interested. 
Right, we're on day four of our maceration of botanicals in the alcohol and it's starting to take on an amazing orange colour from the orange peels and the smell and the flavour is beginning to be a little more well-rounded and it actually tastes a lot like gin now. So what I'm going to do is dilute it in the birch sap and try and get a gin about 40% ABV. So, it's about a litre in this kilner. I'm going to put about 600 ml of birch water in here. And then I'm going to just add the macerated alcohol on top of this about 400 mil. So that should be a 60-40 ratio. So we're going to aim for about here. Caught a few juniper berries in there, but never mind. Can filter those out later. It looks a bit like uh, Fanta or Tango or something. Right, so that dilution there should be about 40% ABV. So, now as well as our gin, we've made some birch syrup. So that was the three litres of birch sap that has been concentrated down over probably a day and a half. And just at the end of its cycle of uh, reducing, I put the slow cooker on to low and just watched it until it was kind of at a concentration that I was happy with. And it's lovely and syrupy now. And you notice that compared to a lot of other people's birch syrup on the internet, which will look black, it's because they've reduced it really fast and they've actually burnt all the sugar in it. But if you do it in the slow cooker, you can get this lovely kind of lemony coloured syrup. And it's well, absolutely delicious. Really, really sweet. Almost kind of, uh, almost a bit sherbetty actually. Now, if you keep reducing your birch syrup, you can make a product which is birch toffee. And it looks like this really amazing, sticky, sugary toffee lump here. And it's absolutely delicious. You have to make sure you do it very slowly not to burn it and you don't get any burnt flavours. But if you can get it down uh, heating and reducing really slowly, you can scrape this lovely kind of molasses toffee off the bottom of the slow cooker and so I thought naturally the thing to do with syrup and toffee would be to make some pancakes and we can have a bit of a gin and tonic at the same time to enjoy it. Whilst the pancake cooks let's give this birch sap gin a go. Amazing notes of lemon and orange and actually the pine needles coming through a wee bit there as well and subtle juniper. Probably if I was doing it again and I wanted to taste more of the juniper and pine I'd put maybe half the amount of the citrus peeler in because it's quite overpowering and tastes, uh, well smells at the moment a lot like tango or fanta or something like that. Ooh. Well, that's so much better than I thought it would be. Ooh, wow. It's really like uh, an explosion of kind of citrus and fresh flavours. It's quite sweet because of the birch sap as well. And uh, it's just got like an ever so slightly hint of the kind of fresh green pine needles in there. The juniper actually is not that prevalent at all. Probably could have maybe crushed the berries up a bit more to get some more flavour out of them. 
but it's definitely gin, you can tell. And it's mellowed beautifully. I think I'll probably, what I might end up doing actually is put the, some of the botanicals back in here and sort of mellow them out in the lower alcohol percentage gin for a bit and see if I can get some more kind of mellow flavors out of it. But that's amazing. It's really, really good kind of spring, summery, fresh, uplifting taste. Whoa. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'd encourage you to go and try harvesting your own birch sap and see what you think, see if it makes you feel any better. And um, just remember, be respectful to the tree, make sure you use clean tools to work with it and uh, remove all your tapping equipment after you've finished harvesting. Enjoy. <laughs>